in Carson City. I feel very much as if I had just awakened out of a long sleep. I attribute it to the fact that I have slept the greater part of the time for the last two days and nights. On Wednesday I sat up all night in Virginia in order to be up early enough to take the five o'clock stage on Thursday morning. I was on time. It was a great success. I had a cheerful trip down to Carson, in company with that incessant talker, Joseph T. Goodman. I never saw him flooded with such a flow of spirits before. He restrained his conversation, though, until we had traveled three or four miles, and were just crossing the divide between Silver City and Spring Valley, when he thrust his head out of the dark stage, and allowed a pallid light from the coach lamps to illuminate his features for a moment, after which he returned to darkness again, and sighed, and said, Damn it! with some asperity. I asked him who he meant it for, and he said, The weather out there! As we approached Carson at about half-past seven o'clock, he thrust his head out again, and gazed earnestly in the direction of that city, after which he took it in again, with his nose very much frosted. He propped the end of that organ upon the end of his finger, and looked pensively upon it, which had the effect of making him cross-eyed, and remarked, Oh, damn it! with great bitterness. I asked him what was up this time, and he said, The cold, damp fog, it is worse than the weather. This was his last. He never spoke again in my hearing. He went on over the mountain with a lady fellow passenger from here. That will stop his chatter, you know, for he seldom speaks in the presence of ladies. In the evening I felt a mighty inclination to go to a party, somewhere. There was to be one at Governor J. Neely Johnson's, and I went there and asked permission to stand around a while. This was granted in the most hospitable manner, and the vision of plain quadrilles soothed my weary soul. I felt particularly comfortable, for if there is one thing more grateful to my feelings than another, it is a new house, a large house, with its ceilings embellished with snowy mouldings, its floors glowing with warm-tented carpets, with cushioned chairs and sofas to sit on, and a piano to listen to, with fires so arranged you can see them, and know there is no humbug about it with walls garnished with pictures, and above all mirrors, wherein you may gaze and always find something to admire, you know. I have a great regard for a good house, and a girlish passion for mirrors. Horace Smith, Esquire, is also very fond of mirrors. He came and looked in the glass for an hour with me. Finally, it cracked. The night was pretty cold and Horace Smith's reflection was split right down the centre. But where his face had been, the damage was greatest. A hundred cracks converged to his reflected nose, like spokes from the hub of a wagon-wheel. It was the strangest freak the weather has done this winter, and yet the parlour seemed warm and comfortable, too. About nine o'clock, the unreliable came, and asked Governor Johnson to let him stand on the porch. The creature has got more impudence than any person I ever saw in my life. Well, he stood and flattened his nose against the parlor window, and looked hungry and vicious. He always looks that way, until Colonel Musser, arrived with some ladies, when he actually fell in their wake, and came swaggering in, looking as if he thought he had been anxiously expected. He had on my fine kid boots, my plug hat, my white kid gloves, with slices of his prodigious hands grinning through the bursted seams, and my heavy gold repeater, 
which I had been offered thousands and thousands of dollars for many and many a time. He took those articles out of my trunk at Washoe City about a month ago, when we went there to report the proceedings of the convention. The unreliable intruded himself upon me in his cordial way, and said, How are you, Mark, old boy? When do you come down? It's brilliant, ain't it? Appear to enjoy themselves, don't they? Lend a fellow two bits, can't you? He always winds up his remarks that way. He appears to have an insatiable craving for two bits. The music struck up just then and saved me. The next moment I was far, far at sea in the plain quadrille. We carried it through with distinguished success. That is, we got as far as balance around and half a man left when I smelled hot whiskey punch, or something of that nature. I tracked the scent through several rooms, and finally discovered a large bowl from which it emanated. I found the omnipresent, unreliable, there also. He set down an empty goblet, and remarked that he was diligently seeking the gentleman's dressing-room. I would have shown him where it was, but it occurred to him that the supper-table and the punch-bowl ought not to be left unprotected, wherefore we stayed there and watched them until the punch entirely evaporated. A servant came in then to replenish the bowl, and we left the refreshments in his charge. We probably did wrong, but we were anxious to join the hazy dance. The dance was hazier than usual, after that, sixteen couples on the floor at once, with a few dozen spectators scattered around, is calculated to have its effect in a brilliantly lighted parlor, I believe. Everything seemed to buzz, at any rate. After all the modern dances had been danced several times, the people adjourned to the supper room. I found my wardrobe out there, as usual, with the unreliable in it. His old distemper was upon him. He was desperately hungry. I never saw a man eat as much as he did in my life. I have various items of his supper here in my notebook. First, he ate a plate of sandwiches. Then he ate a handsomely iced pound cake. Then he gobbled a dish of chicken salad after which he ate a roast pig, after that a quantity of blanc mange. Then he threw in several dozen glasses of punch, to fortify his appetite, and finished his monstrous repast with a roast turkey. Dishes of brandy grapes and jellies and such things, and pyramids of fruits melted away before him as shadows fly at the sun's approach. I am of the opinion that none of his ancestors were present when the five thousand were miraculously fed in the old scriptural times. I base my opinion on the twelve bushels of scraps and the little fishes that remained over after that feast. If the unreliable himself had been there, the provisions would just about have held out, I think. At about two o'clock in the morning, the pleasant party broke up, and the crowd of guests distributed themselves around town to their respective homes, and after thinking the fun all over again, I went to bed at four o'clock. So, having been awake forty-eight hours, I slept forty-eight in order to get even again. City Marshal Perry John Van Buren Perry, recently re-elected City Marshal of Virginia County, was born a long time ago in County Kerry, Ireland, of poor but honest parents, who were descendants, beyond question, of a house of high antiquity. The founder of it was distinguished for his eloquence, he was the property of one Balaam, and received honorable mention in the Bible.
John Van Buren Perry removed to the United States in 1792, after having achieved a high gastronomical reputation by creating the first famine in his native land, and established himself at Kinderhook, New Jersey, as a teacher of vocal and instrumental music. His eldest son, Martin Van Buren, was educated there, and was afterwards elected President of the United States. His grandson, of the same name, is now a prominent New York politician, and is known in the East as Prince John. He keeps up a constant and affectionate correspondence with his worthy grandfather, who sells him feet in some of his richest wildcat claims from time to time. While residing at Kinderhook, Jack Perry was appointed Commodore of the United States Navy, and he forthwith proceeded to Lake Erie and fought the mighty marine conflict which blazes upon the pages of history as Perry's victory. In consequence of this exploit, he narrowly escaped the presidency. Several years ago, Commodore Perry was appointed Commissioner Extraordinary to the Imperial Court of Japan, with unlimited power to treat. It is hardly worth while to mention that he never exercised that power. He never treated anybody in that country, although he patiently submitted to a vast amount of that sort of thing when the opportunity was afforded him at the expense of the Japanese officials. He returned from his mission full of honors and foreign whiskey, and was welcomed home again by the plaudits of a grateful nation. After the war was ended, Mr. Perry removed to Providence, Rhode Island, where he produced a complete revolution in medical science by inventing the celebrated pain killer which bears his name. He manufactured this liniment by the shipload, and spread it far and wide over the suffering world. Not a bottle left his establishment without his beneficent portrait upon the label, whereby, in time, his features became as well known unto burned and mutilated children as Jack the Giant Killers. When pain had ceased throughout the universe, Mr. Perry fell to writing, for a livelihood, and for years and years he poured out his soul in pleasing and effeminate poetry, his very first effort commencing, How doth the little busy bee improve each shining hour, etc., gained him a splendid literary reputation, and from that time forward no Sunday school library was complete without a full edition of his plaintive and sentimental Perry Gorix. After great research and profound study of his subject, he produced that wonderful gem which is known in every land as the young mother's apostrophe to her infant, beginning, Fie, fie, o oh itty bitty pooty sing, to poku footsie tootsies into mamma's eye. This inspired poem had a tremendous run, and carried Perry's fame into every nursery in the civilized world, but he was not destined to wear his laurels undisturbed. England, with monstrous perfidy, at once claimed the apostrophe for her favorite son, Martin Farquhar Tupper, and sent up a howl of vindictive abuse from her polluted press against our beloved Perry. With one accord, the American people rose up in his defense, and a devastating war was only averted by a public denial of the paternity of the poem by the great proverbial over his own signature. This noble act of Mr. Tupper gained him a high place in the affection of this people, and his sweet platitudes have been read here with an ever-augmented spirit of tolerance since that day. The conduct of England toward Mr. Perry told upon his constitution to such an extent that at one time it was feared the gentle bard would fade and flicker out altogether. Wherefore, 
the solicitude of influential officials was aroused in his behalf and through their generosity he was provided with an asylum in sing sing prison a quiet retreat in the state of new york here he wrote his last great poem beginning let dogs delight to bark and bite for god hath made them so your little hands were never made to tear out each other's eyes with and then proceeded to learn the shoemaker's trade in his new home under the distinguished masters employed by the commonwealth ever since mr perry arrived at man's estate his prodigious feet have been a subject of complaint and annoyance to those communities which have known the honour of his presence in eighteen thirty five during a great leather famine when many people were obliged to wear wooden shoes and mr perry for the sake of economy transferred his bootmaking patronage from the tanyard which had before enjoyed his custom to an undertaker's establishment that is to say he wore coffins at that time he was a member of congress from new jersey and occupied a seat in front of the speaker's throne he had the uncouth habit of propping his feet upon his desk during prayer by the chaplain and thus completely hiding that officer from every eye save that of omnipotence alone so long as the honourable mr perry wore orthodox leather boots the clergyman submitted to this infliction and prayed behind them in singular solitude under mild protest but when he arose one morning to offer up his regular petition and beheld the cheerful apparition of jack perry's coffins confronting him quote, the jolly old bum went under the table like a sick porpoise close quote, as mr p feelingly remarks quote, and never shot off his mouth in that shanty again close quote. mr perry's first appearance on the pacific coast was upon the boards of the san francisco theatres in the character of old pete and dion bouchicot's octoroon so excellent was his delineation of that celebrated character that perry's pete was for a long time regarded as the climax of histrionic perfection since john van buren perry has resided in nevada territory he has employed his talents in acting as city marshal of virginia and in abusing me because i am an orphan and a long way from home and can therefore be prosecuted with impunity he was re-elected day before yesterday and his first official act was an attempt to get me drunk on champagne furnished to the board of aldermen by other successful candidates so that he might achieve the honour and glory of getting me in the station house for once in his life although he failed in his object he followed me down c street and handcuffed me in front of tom peasley's but officers birdsell and larkin and brokaw rebelled against this unwarranted assumption of authority and released me whereupon i was about to punish jack perry severely when he offered me six bits to hand him down to posterity through the medium of this biography and i closed the contract but after all i never expect to get the money a sunday in carson i arrived in this noisy and bustling town of carson at noon to-day per layton's express we made pretty good time from virginia and might have made much better but for horace smith esq who rode on the box seat and kept the stage so much by the head she wouldn't steer i went to church of course i always go to church when i <clears throat> when i go to church as it were 
I got there just in time to hear the closing hymn, and also to hear the Reverend Mr. White give out a long meter doxology, which the choir tried to sing to a short meter tune. But there wasn't music enough to go around. Consequently, the effect was rather singular than otherwise. They sang the most interesting parts of each line, though, and charged the balance to profit and loss. This rendered the general intent and meaning of the doxology considerably mixed, as far as the congregation were concerned, but inasmuch as it was not addressed to them, anyhow, I thought it made no particular difference. By an easy and pleasant transition, I went from church to jail. It was only just downstairs, for they save men eternally in the second story of the new courthouse, and damned them for life in the first. Sheriff Gasserick has a handsome double office fronting on the street, and its walls are gorgeously decorated with iron convict jewelry. In the rear are two rows of cells built of bomb-proof masonry, and furnished with strong iron doors and resistless locks and bolts. There was but one prisoner, Swayze, the murderer of Derrickson, and he was riding. I do not know what his subject was, but he appeared to be handling it in a way which gave him great satisfaction. Advice to the Unreliable on church going in the first place i must impress upon you that when you are dressing for church as a general thing you mix your perfumes too much your fragrance is sometimes oppressive you saturate yourself with cologne and bergamot until you make a sort of hamlet's ghost of yourself and no man can decide with the first whiff whether you bring with you air from heaven or from hell. Now, rectify this matter as soon as possible. Last Sunday you smelled like a secretary to a consolidated drug store and barber shop, and you came and sat in the same pew with me. Now, don't do that again. In the next place, when you design coming to church, don't lie in bed until half-past ten o'clock, and then come in looking all swelled and torpid like a doughnut. Do reflect upon it, and show some respect for your personal appearance hereafter. There is another matter, also, which I wish to remonstrate with you about. Generally, when the contribution box of the missionary department is passing around, you begin to look anxious and fumble in your vest pockets as if you felt a mighty desire to put all your worldly wealth into it. Yet when it reaches your pew, you are sure to be absorbed in your prayer book or gazing pensively out of the window at far-off mountains or buried in meditation with your sinful head supported by the back of the pew before you and after the box is gone again, you usually start suddenly and gaze after it with a yearning look, mingled with an expression of bitter disappointment, fumbling your cash again, meantime, as if you felt you had missed the one grand opportunity for which you had been longing all your life. Now, to do this when you have money in your pockets is mean. But I have seen you do a meaner thing. I refer to your conduct last Sunday, when the contribution box arrived at your pew, and the angry blood rises to my cheek when I remember with what gravity and sweet serenity of countenance you put in fifty cents and took out two dollars and a half. THE UNRELIABLE EDITOR'S ENTERPRISE I received the following atrocious document the morning I arrived here. It was from that abandoned, profligate, 
the unreliable, and I think it speaks for itself. Carson City, Thursday morning. To the unreliable. Sir, observing the driver of the Virginia stage hunting after you this morning, in order to collect his fare, I infer you are in town. In the paper which you represent, I noticed an article which I took to be an effusion from your muddled brain, stating that I had cabbaged a number of valuable articles from you the night I took you out of the streets of Washoe City, and permitted you to occupy my bed. I take this opportunity to inform you that I will compensate you at the rate of twenty dollars per head for every one of these valuable articles that I received from you, providing you will relieve me of their presence. This offer can be either accepted or rejected on your part, but providing you don't see proper to accept it, you had better procure enough lumber to make a box four by eight, and have it made as early as possible. Judge Dixon will arrange the preliminaries if you don't exceed. An early reply is expected by reliable. Not satisfied with wounding my feelings by making the most extraordinary reference to allusions in the above note, he even sent a challenge to fight in the same envelope with it, hoping to work upon my fears and drive me from the country by intimidation. But I was not to be frightened. I shall remain in the territory. I guessed his object at once, and determined to accept his challenge, chose weapons and things, and scare him, instead of being scared myself. I wrote a stern reply to him, and offered him mortal combat with boot-jacks at a hundred yards. The effect was more agreeable than I could have hoped for. His hair turned black in a single night from excess of fear. Then he went into a fit of melancholy, and while it lasted he did nothing but sigh and sob and snuffle and slobber and say he wished he was in the quiet tomb. Finally he said he would commit suicide. He would say farewell to the cold, cold world, with its cares and troubles, and go to sleep with his fathers, in perdition. Then rose up this young man, and threw his demijohn out of the window, and took up a glass of pure water, and drained it to the dregs, and then he fell to the floor in a swoon. Dr. Jader was called in, and as soon as he found that the cuss was poisoned, he rushed down to the Magnolia Saloon and got the antidote, and poured it down him. As he was drawing his last breath, he scented the brandy, and lingered yet a while on earth to take a drink with the boys. But for this he would have been no more, or possible a great deal less, in a moment. So he survived, but he has been in a mighty precarious condition ever since. I have been up to see how he was getting along two or three times a day. He is a very sick man. I was up there a while ago, and I could see that his friends had begun to entertain hopes that he would not get over it. As soon as I saw that, all my enmity vanished, and I even felt like doing the poor unreliable a kindness, and showing him, too, how my feelings toward him had changed. So I went and bought him a beautiful coffin, and carried it up and set it down on his bed, and told him to climb in when his time was up. Well, sir, you never saw a man so affected by a little act of kindness as he was by that. He let off a sort of war-whoop, and went to kicking things around like a crazy man, and he foamed at the mouth, and went out of one fit into another faster than I could take them down in my notebook. I did not return to Virginia yesterday on account of the wedding. 
the parties were hon james h sturdivant one of the first piutes of nevada and miss emma curry daughter of the hon a curry who also claims that he is a piute family of high antiquity i had heard it reported that a marriage was threatened so felt it my duty to go down there and find out the facts of the case they said i might stay as it was me i promised not to say anything about the wedding and i regard that promise as sacred my word is as good as my bond the father bennett advanced and touched off the high contracting parties with the hymeneal torch married them you know and at the word of command from curry the fiddle bows were set in motion and the plain quadrilles turned loose thereupon some of the most responsible dancing ensued that i ever saw in my life the dance that tam o'shanter witnessed was slow in comparison to it they kept it up for six hours and then carried out the exhausted musicians on a shutter and went down to supper i know they had a fine supper and plenty of it but i do not know much else they drank so much champagne around me that i got confused and lost the hang of things as it were it was mighty pleasant jolly and sociable and i wished to thunder i was married myself i took a large slice of bridal cake home with me to dream on and dreamt that i was still a single man and likely to remain so if i live and nothing happens which has given me a greater confidence in dreams than i ever felt before i cordially wish my newly married couple all kinds of happiness and prosperity though ye sentimental law student editors enterprise i found the following letter or valentine or whatever it is lying on the summit where it had been dropped unintentionally i think it was written on a sheet of legal cap and each line was duly commenced with the red mark which traversed the sheet from top to bottom solon appeared to have had some trouble getting his effusion started to suit him he had begun it quote, know all men by these presents close quote and scratched it out again he had substituted quote, now at this day comes the plaintiff by his attorney close quote and scratch that out also he had tried other sentences of like character and gone on obliterating them until through much sorrow and tribulation he achieved the dedication which stands at the head of his letter and to his entire satisfaction i do cheerfully hope but what a villain a man must be to blend together the beautiful language of love and the infernal phraseology of the law in one and the same sentence i know but one of god's creatures who would be guilty of such depravity as this i refer to the unreliable I believe the unreliable to be the very lawyer's cub who sat upon the solitary peak all soaked in beer and sentiment and concocted the insipid literary hash i am talking about the handwriting closely resembles his semi chinese tarantula marks sugar loaf peak february fourteenth eighteen sixty three to the loveliness to whom these presents shall come greeting this is a lovely day my own mary its unencumbered sunshine reminds me of your happy face and in the imagination of the same doth now appear before me such sights and scenes as this ever remind me the party of the second part of you my mary the peerless the party of the first part the view from the lonely and segregated mountain peak of this portion of what is called and known as creation with all and singular the 
hereditaments and appurtenances thereunto appertaining and belonging is inexpressibly grand and inspiring and i gaze and gaze while my soul is filled with holy delight and my heart expands to receive thy spirit presence as aforesaid above me is the glory of the sun around him float the messenger clouds ready alike to bless the earth with gentle rain or visit it with lightning and thunder and destruction far below the said sun and the messenger clouds aforesaid lying prone upon the earth in the verge of the distant horizon like the burnished shield of a giant mine eyes behold a lake which is described and set forth in maps as the sink of carson near in the great plain i see the desert spread abroad like the mantle of a colossus glowing by turns with the warm light of the sun herein before mentioned or darkly shaded by the messenger clouds aforesaid flowing at right angles with said desert and adjacent thereto i see the silver and sinuous thread of the river commonly called carson which winds its tortuous course through the softly tented valley and disappears amid the gorges of the bleak and snowy mountains a simile of man leaving the pleasant valley of peace and virtue to wander among the dark defiles of sin beyond the jurisdiction of the kindly beaming sun aforesaid and about said sun and the said clouds and around the said mountain and over the plain and the river aforesaid there floats a purple glory a yellow mist as airy and beautiful as the bridal veil of a princess about to be wedded according to the rites and ceremonies pertaining to and established by the laws or edicts of the kingdom or principality wherein she doth reside and whereof she hath been and doth continue to be a lawful sovereign or subject ah my mary it is sublime it is lovely i have declared and made known and by these presents do declare and make known unto you that the view from sugar-loaf peak as herein before described and set forth is the loveliest picture with which the hand of the creator has adorned the earth according to the best of my knowledge and belief so help me god given under my hand and in the spirit presence of the bright being whose love has restored the light of hope to a soul once groping in the darkness of despair on the day and year first above written signed solon lycurgus law student and notary public in and for the said county of story and territory in nevada to miss mary lynx virginia and may the laws have her in their holy keeping 